Welcome back to Questing Beast, I'm Ben. Today we'll be taking a look at the box set for the Forbidden Lands. This is a campaign setting and rule set created by Free League. It was published a few years back, I believe, as part of a Kickstarter. Uh, I received a boxed set copy here because I did help work on one of the adventures for the Forbidden Lands. That's in a, a separate supplement that I might look at later. Uh, but today we're going to look through half of this box set. We're going to look at the player focused materials and they'll be making a second video looking at the game master material. So stay tuned for that. Uh, before we start though, a quick shout out to today's sponsor, which is Michael Gelfi and his huge library of over 600 tracks of D&D ambiance. Uh, the amount of variety here is really astounding. It's everything from an underground mushroom forest to a trap room slowly filling with sand to more mundane stuff, like perhaps a, a local tavern or a fantasy city. It's incredibly well done. The sounds are beautiful. They're immersive. They pull your players in. I love using them during my own sessions. If you want to check those out, most of the tracks are free over on YouTube or on Spotify. Thanks again to Michael Gelhe for sponsoring. Now let's get back to our review. What do we have inside of our box? Well, to begin with, we have our map. So this map is quite large and it's very, very detailed. Let me open it up here. So this is only one fourth of the map. I can't really show the whole thing on this screen, although you'll see a smaller version of it inside the book when I show that. We have a key over here. We have different terrain types and we have different hexes. And we also have uh, locations that are marked here, but notice how these do not have names or um, a special key related to them, apart from just being a village, a dungeon or a castle because you are going to be able to fill those in as to what you want them to be. We also have a sticker set, which is a really cool touch. So what this is going to allow you to do is take these stickers off and affix them to the hexes. I think they have a clear background, so you're only going to be able to see the symbol. And uh, these can represent you know, the different parts of the world uh, as you discover them, because it does encourage you to create your own adventure sites, and these can represent those. One really nice touch here is that there are these little tombstone markers, which is really great. So when a player character dies, you can mark where they're buried. I really like that. It does put an emphasis on the fact that this is a more open world exploration game and that a uh, player death is definitely on the table. The whole system has an OSR influence to it uh, quite explicitly. And uh, so there's a very exploration and uh, resource management uh, aspect to the whole thing. So this is our Game Master's Guide, which we will look at later. And today we'll be looking at the Player's Handbook. It's really beautiful looking. Done in this faux leather with a gold foil stamp on the front. The binding is very nice. I think it is stitched binding. It's a little hard to tell. Yep, it appears to be stitched binding. Really great paper quality. It feels really nice in your hand. Excellent printing. Does it stay all the way open when you open it? Well, mostly. It does a lot better than most books I've looked at, and, and it's a nice size. Um, it's a balance between a very small digest size and the much larger uh, sizes that we see for like Dungeons and Dragons, for example. So here's our map of our world. Uh, it's quite extensive. The region that I showed you is probably only like about that area down there. We have our different regions mapped out. And then later on, I believe in the Game Master's book, we have more information about the different areas here. Inside we find uh, the lead designer is Thomas Hurenstam. And uh, the main illustrator is Nils Gulliksen, who I believe is a well-known illustrator in um, Scandinavia, where this comes from. Uh, it's not someone I'm really familiar with personally, um, but a lot of people in Scandinavia seem to be quite aware of him. I'm not sure which role-playing games he worked on. Uh, his art is all throughout this book. So introduction. What do you do here? Basic introduction to role-playing. What is a player? What is a game master? What are you going to be doing? You'll be discovering adventure sites. You'll be uncovering the secrets of the land. You'll be searching for four elven gemstones. This is related to the Raven's Purge which is a uh, adventure series, I suppose you would call it, um, a campaign that's been published separately from these books. So these books are going to have a number of adventure sites. I think like three that are really fleshed out. 
and it's going to contain generators for making more. But if you want lots of pre-made adventure locations, then I suppose you have to get the Raven's Purge. One thing that uh, it points out here that I quite like is that uh, the Raven's Purge is not a linear campaign at all. Instead, it has a bunch of locations and you can explore them in really any order and put together the campaign in your head from all the clues scattered around as you go, which I think is a good way to do it. You can be building your stronghold. So this does have a very old school D&D flavor to it where you can uh, find a castle and turn it into your own stronghold and recruit followers and improve it and um, become more immersed in the setting if you're into the logistics aspect of that. Uh, let's look at our character sheets real quickly because I think that is a good way to get a sense quickly of what the game is going to be like. Here we go. So you have four basic attributes, strength, agility, wits, and empathy, which can be rated one through six. And then you have skills down here, which also can have a rating. So this uses the same basic system that Free League has used in previous games, such as Mutant Year Zero or Tales from the Loop or Alien, uh, where it's a D6 base system and you would add up the amount of points you have for your attributes and maybe a related skill, roll a big handful of dice, and you're looking to get a six. One six on any die, means you are successful. If you roll more than one six, it could mean uh, an improved success in some way. One thing that this adds is that you are able to push your rolls, which means that you can uh, re-roll all of them if you want to, and you can you know, try again for a success. But if you do something like that, then if you roll a one, it can mean that things go really badly for you, like a weapon breaks, for example. We have things like your pride and your dark secret weapons, armor, uh, relationships with other people, gear, mounts, notes. And we have a sheet over here for your stronghold as well, which really tells you how much um, focus they're putting on that as a feature of the game. The functions, you can build improvements to your stronghold, hire hirelings, your stockpile of resources, and so on. All right, let's go back to the beginning here. So it is going to be a D6 based system. There's going to be a couple other dice that you can use occasionally, usually with uh, legendary items or more powerful artifacts. We'll sometimes use um, bigger dice sizes. And you're going to be creating your adventurer. So starting off with your kin, you can be a human, elf, half elf, dwarf, halfling, wolf, kin, orc, goblin, and then professions, which are like your classes. You have uh, druids. Fighters, hunters, minstrels, peddlers, riders and rogues, and sorcerers. And so each of these is going to have a key attribute and some starting skills, um, a pride, which you can make up for yourself, a dark secret, relationships, and gear. There's a lot of suggestions here, but it's pretty open-ended as to how you want to make your character. Your age does come into play here because it's going to determine what your the number of points that you have uh, starting out for your when you're creating your character. That's going to differ depending on your age group. You're going to have some skills and talents. Talents are kind of like feats or special abilities. We'll be looking at that in just a second. Uh, your pride, for example, uh, nothing scares me as I have seen the whole uh, as I have seen the world behind the veil. It could be one pride. You can make up your own for your character, and that is going to have some mechanical impact. There is encumbrance rules here. That's going to be very important since this is a resource management and you know, overland exploration game. You're going to need to know how much you can carry over what distance. Getting experience. So here's your basic XP system. It has a number of questions that you ask. This reminds me a little bit of Dungeon World, uh, where you could be... Um, did you discover a new adventure site? Did you defeat one or more monsters? Did you find treasure, one gold or more? And then for each one where you answer yes, you get an experience point. And then you can spend those points on getting improvements, like buying more skills or talents or getting more magic. There's also a reputation system. So people may recognize you as you gain reputation. The basic system um, of the dice here, where you're rolling all your dice and trying to get at least one six, pushing your roll. Um, if you fail your rolls, you have the opportunity to gain willpower. So for example, to push yourself to the brink of your abilities is risky, but can also have positive effects. It gives you the force of will required to use powerful kin talents and profession talents. Um, I believe it also works for magic as well. So by failing, 
uh, you can gain this uh, meta currency that you can use to you know, push yourself further in other ways. Um, I'm usually not a huge fan of meta currency, um, but this is pretty straightforward. And um, it is rooted in the fiction in the sense that if you're failing and failing, then you are going to become more and more frustrated. But that frustration fuels you to do more stuff. So I guess it might also push players to take on more dangerous activities just so they can get more willpower points. Um, some rules on artifact dice for more powerful items. A rundown of our different skills that we have here and how they work. So combat is just going to use one of your skills like marksmanship or melee combat. Now talents, these are all your special abilities. Here's a list of them right here. So there's a kin talent. So every different um, kin, which is like the races in D&D, those are all going to have a special ability just for them. And then each profession has three different uh, talents that you can choose from. And then there's also a, a variety of general talents that anyone can choose from. So there is a reasonable amount of customization here. It's not um, super detailed. You're not going to be making complex builds, um, but you are going to have quite a few features to pick from. So for example, if you're a minstrel, it could be the path of a path of the hymn where your songs can help your comrades get up on their feet. The path of the song where your beautiful voice can captivate any audiences or the path of the war cry where your voice inspires your comrades and strikes fear into the hearts of your enemies. And each of these talents has three levels that you can progress up through over time by spending XP. Now we're getting to the variety of general talents. Again, these all have three different um, levels or three different ranks that you can rise through. And we're in our section on combat and damage. So uh, initiative works by grabbing uh, 10 cards, labeled one through 10, you can use a normal deck of cards and uh, pulling those out and just giving one to each player. And then you just go in order of your numbers. Really simple and straightforward. Uh, you can either do one slow and one fast action on your turn or two fast actions. And here's our slow actions and here's our fast actions. So for example, slashing or stabbing someone can only be done once per turn. I like how those are actually separate categories. So whether you're slashing at someone or stabbing at them is going to have different mechanical effects. Uh, different um, things like dodging and parrying are going to affect those different types of attacks in a different way. Uh, zones and range. So the combat area is, is divided into zones. So just different sections. You're not actually using miniatures necessarily. You're just either near someone or far away or something like that. Uh, running a close combat is pretty straightforward. It works the same way as uh, skills. So you're going to get a handful of dice. You're going to be using probably your strength and you know your melee combat skill. You're going to be rolling your dice trying to get a six. Opponents can also defend. They can parry. Um, or they can dodge, and so they're going to be able to roll dice and try and get sixes of their own to cancel out yours. Uh, damage is not rolled typically. Damage is either one damage or two damage for really big weapons. So that keeps things really fast. Um, if you looked back on our character sheet, what you'll find is that there is no uh, hit points. Instead, damage comes right off of your attributes. So there is a bit of a death spiral going on here, where if you're hit, it's going to be harder for you to hit back over time. You're going to be physically weakened. So this does make combat very dangerous. You're going to have to think very carefully about whether you want to get involved in it. Overall, um, it is pretty easy to be taken out of the fight since um, strength, for example, which is where most damage in combat goes, only goes up to six at maximum. So if you're being hit with a heavy weapon, you could be taking two damage per hit. You might be out in just two hits. Um, but actually dying is more unusual. There's a little bit of protection against dying in the sense that once you get down to zero, you're going to be rolling on a, well, a death and dismemberment chart, basically, similar to the ones that we see in things like uh, Warhammer Fantasy uh, roleplay, where you can die if you roll a really bad result on those things. There is options for just instant death, but a lot of the time they'll just take an injury of some sort that you can recover from. We'll take a look at that once we get um, further on in the back of the book here. However, if you are taken out of the fight and you're just unconscious on the ground, a monster can walk up to you and just cut your head off. So you do have to be very careful. You're going to need your friends to protect you at all times to avoid just being taken out in combat. 
it is supposed to be a game where uh, it's not combat as sport, it's more combat as war. Uh, looking at our weapons here, so weapons uh, typically do one or two damage. There's some rare examples where a weapon does three damage, but that's really uh, not terribly common. We have pictures here, we have armor and cover. Critical injuries, that's the death and dismemberment table. Uh, recovery is pretty quick. Uh, if you have a rest, if you rest for a quarter day, you can recover all remaining lost attribute points. So you can get back up on your feet pretty quickly by just taking a, um, it would be a long rest, kind of like a long rest in D&D. It's like, you know, uh, six hours or so. Um, but you can get back up on your feet with just a healing roll if your friends have some uh, good healing skills. Um, conditions. Fear, falling, drowning, poison, all the stuff that you're going to need in Overland Adventures. And we have our section on magic here. So there's a number of different magic using professions. And uh, when you roll dice to cast a spell, you do have the option or you do have the possibility of running into magical mishaps. And this can happen basically anytime you're rolling dice for your spells. Um, but if you roll more uh, sixes, then you can increase the power of your spell. So it's a little bit more random. And magical mishaps go anywhere from something really simple, like someone witnesses your magic and tells others, increases your reputation, or it makes you very hungry, all the way it, up to it uh, ripping open a rift to another dimension, and it just, you know, it kills you. You get pulled through to hell and, and you're dead. That's it. Um, so that is, uh, it's a little extreme for me. Uh, I would probably take out the results for instant death for magic because that seems to really disincentivize you from using magic at all. Even if the odds of it happening are pretty low, it means that any time you're rolling dice for magic, you can just die instantly, which would, at least for me, really prevent me from ever using magic. Um, there are options to mitigate that in here where you can um, choose to cast magic at a lower level where you're not rolling dice at all and, and make it automatic. Um, but that does seem to take away you know, from a lot of the whole point of having a magic system at all. If you're just rolling for, or if you're only using very decreased power spells. So I think I would just take away the extreme end of the uh, penalties there. Because if my players die, and, and or my characters have died before, I do like it to be their fault and they should feel like they had it coming. And just total random chance doesn't fit well with that for me. So we have uh, healing magic. These go anywhere from you know, rank one to rank two, all the way up to rank three. This maps onto the different levels that the talents have. So if you have the healing uh, talent, the uh, healing magic talent, and you take it at level three, then you're gonna be able to cast rank three spells in that category. Pretty straightforward. Uh, awareness, uh, symbolism, uh, stone song, Blood magic, death magic are all our different categories here. We have a section on journeys for overland um, discovery and travel. Uh, days are divided into quarter days, so morning, day, evening, and night. That's just how everything's divided up. It's a little bit like how um, turns are done in dungeons in old school D&D, &D, in that a lot of things are kind of hooked onto these sections of the day. So whenever you go to a new quarter day, you're going to decide what you're going to do. You're going to hike, lead the way, keep watch, forage, hunt, or something like that. And we have more information on what those things actually do. If you're leading the way, you're going to be rolling dice and possibly having something bad happen to you. There's a lot of options here. Most of our random tables are D66, where you're rolling two six-sided dice, and you're reading them like one's a tens die, one's a ones die, which gives you 36 options overall. Foraging, hunting, fishing, all of these have mishaps that can go along with them if you roll badly. Sleeping, exploring, and sea travel. We have a section on the stronghold at the end, which really tells you um, to how that's going to work. How are you going to logistically operate a stronghold? How are you going to establish one? You want to try and build one? That's going to be really hard. Um, building a stronghold is extremely expensive, and you're going to need a lot of materials and experts. Much easier to just find a stronghold that's already there and take it over. Uh, the general background of the world here is that um, the Forbidden Lands is a section of the world that has been long um, underneath this curse, I suppose, um, known as the Blood Mist. So the idea here is that there is a evil, bloody mist that has surrounds the land, especially at night. So if you go out of your house or out of your castle, then it's going to devour you. So all of these settlements that are stuck 
in the Forbidden Lands when the blood mist uh, came upon the land or have been trapped there for hundreds of years. But only recently it has lifted and now all of these different peoples are able to explore and see what's out there. And so they're discovering all of these different you know, miniature cultures that have sprung up, including ruins and castles and uh, similar things. And you're going to be doing that right along with them. Functions and hirelings. So you can hire all sorts of different people, like a master builder to help you build things. There's rules for what happens if you leave your stronghold unguarded for a while. Our functions here include things like a dovecote, a dungeon, a field, a fireplace, forge, gallows, all the different add-ons that you can attach to your castle or your stronghold in order to make it um, more effective. They all have requirements. They have raw materials you have to gather, tools, time, reputation. For example, if you want a bakery to bake bread, you're going to need a mill to grind grain. But if you're going to need grain, you have to plant a field as well. And fields once a year pro provide a huge amount of grain that you can put into your mill and then bake into bread. So there's a whole lot of uh, long-term logistics here. Here's the different hirelings you can get, like a baker, a boyer, a bowyer, sorry, a carpenter, executioner, a farmer, a guard, and so on. Each of them has a salary. Uh, there can be battles at your stronghold, how to survive sieges and how to deal with that. And then we have a section on gear at the very end, including uh, trade goods. So, for example, um, a cauldron. How much does it cost? Um, how, what does it weigh? Uh, what iron, what raw materials do you need in order to build it? How long does it take to make? So you can really get into the nitty gritty here if you uh, want in terms of building up your keep and ruling the land. At the back, we have tables for critical injuries, including slash wounds, a blunt force. So the, the type of attack that you receive is going to determine what kind of critical injury you get. Anything from decapitation, instant death, to just your uh, forehead bleeding. If you have a lethal one, for example, a punctured lung, uh, this is a time limit D6 days. You can die within D6 days. So that does give you a lot of time in order to get healed. If you don't get healed in that time, then you're going to die. Um, so as you can see, most of these you're not going to die or you're going to have a lot of opportunity to get healed. It's only with the very extreme end of the spectrum that you'll have instant death. And then we have our character sheets and so on at the very back. So those are our rules for the players. Uh, quite a bit of options available there in terms of making your own character. Uh, lots of rules for exploration and for building your own stronghold. This is designed for the campaign world that the Forbidden Lands comes with but uh, it's definitely open to worlds of your own. I think you could play this in Forgotten Realms or really in any D&D-like world. wouldn't have too much of a problem. Uh, the way that the magic works and stuff is more unique to the system, um, but it's not fixed to a particular world, is all I'm saying. Thanks for watching today. Make sure to stay tuned for the second video where I will be looking at the Game Master material for Forbidden Lands and you will be able to see what kind of options it gives you for running such a large open world, which can always be a bit of a challenge. Shout out to some of our new patrons over on Patreon, including Jeremy Abernathy, John Schwartz, Douglas Topper, JPM Skywizard, and Ardashir Leah. Thank you so much for supporting us. All right, thanks for watching everybody. See you next time.